Who are you? the king demanded. What do you want of me? Drin potted his stirrups, nuzzling his boots. You don't know me, my boy? No, how should you? How should I deserve to have you know me? I am your father, your poor, old, overjoyed father. I am the one who left you in the marketplace on that winter night long ago and handed you over to your heroic destiny. How wise I was and how sad for so long and how proud I am now. My boy, my little boy. He could not quite cry real tears, but his nose was running. Without a word, King Lear tugged at his horse's reins, backing him out of the crowd. Old Drin let his outstretched arms drop to his sides. This is what it is to have children, he screeched. Ungrateful son, will you desert your father in the hour of, dis of his distress, when a word from your pet wizard would have set everything right again? Despise me if you will, but I have played my part in putting you where you are, and you dare not deny it. Villainy has its rights, too. Still, the king would have turned away, but Schmendrick touched his arm and leaned near. It's true, you know, he whispered, but for him, but for them all. The tale would never have worked out quite another way, and who can say that the ending would have ever been as happy as this? You must be their king, and you must rule them as kindly as you would a braver and more faithful folk, for they are part of your fate. Then Lear lifted his hand to the people of Hagsgate, and they pushed and elbowed one another for silence. He said, I must ride with my friends, and keep them company for a way, but I will leave my men-at-arms here, and they will help you begin to be begin to build your town again. When I return in a little time, I also will help. I will not begin to build my new castle until I see Hagsgate standing once more. They complained bitterly that Schmendrick could do it all in a moment by means of his magic. But he answered them, I could not even, even if I would. There are laws that govern the wizard's art, as laws command the seasons and the sea. Magic made you wealthy once, when all others in the land were poor. But your days of prosperity have ended, and now you must start over. What was wasteland in Haggard's time shall grow green and generous again. But Hagsgate will yield a living exactly as miserly as the hearts that dwell there. You may plant your acres again, and raise up your fallen orchards and vineyards, but they will never flourish as they used to. Never. Until you learn to take joy in them for no reason. He gazed on the silent townsfolk with no anger in his glance, but only pity. If I were you, I would have children he said, and then to King Lear, How says you, your majesty? Shall we sleep here tonight and be on our way at dawn? But the king turned and rode away out of ruined Hagsgate as fast as he could spur. It was long before Molly and the magician came up with him, and longer still before they lay down to sleep. For many days they journeyed through Lear's domain, and each day they knew it less and delighted in it more. The spring ran on before them as swiftly as fire, clothing all that was naked and opening everything that had long ago shut up tight, touching the earth as the unicorn had touched Lear. Every sort of animal, from bears to black beetles, came sporting or shambling or scurrying along their way, and the high sky that had been sandy and arid as the soil itself now blossomed with birds, swirling so thickly that it seemed like sunset most of the day. Fish bent and flickered in the whisking streams, and wild flowers raced up and down the hills like escaped prisoners. All the land was noisy with life, but it was the silent rejoicing of the flowers that kept the three travelers awake at night. The folk of the villages greeted them cautiously, and with little less dourness than they had shown when Schmendrick and Molly first came their way. Only the oldest among them had ever seen the spring before, and many suspected the rampaging greenness of being a plague or an invasion. 
King Lear told them that Haggard was dead, and the Red Bull gone forever, invited them to visit when his new castle was raised, and passed on. They will need time to feel comfortable with flowers, he said. Wherever they stopped, he left word that all outlaws were pardoned, and Molly hoped that the news would come to Captain Cully and his merry band. As it happened, it did, and the merry band immediately abandoned the life of the Greenwood, saving only Cully himself and Jack Jingley. Together, they took up the trade of wandering minstrels and were reported to have become reasonably popular in the provinces. One night, the three slept at the farthest frontier of Ling Lear's kingdom, making their beds in high grass. The king would bid them farewell in the morning and return to Hagsgate. It will be lonely, he said in the darkness. I would rather go with you and not be king. Oh, you'll get to like it, Schmendrick replied. The best young men of the villages will make their way to your court, and you will teach them to be knights and heroes. The wisest of ministers will come to counsel you, and the most skillful musicians and jugglers and storytellers will come seeking your favor. And there will be a princess in time, either fleeing her unspeakably wicked father and brothers or seeking justice for them. Perhaps you will hear of her, shut her in a fortress of flint and adamant, her only companion a compassionate spider. I don't care about that, King Lear said. He was silent for so long that Schmendrick thought he had fallen asleep, but presently he said, I wish I could see her once more, to tell her all my heart. She will never know what I really meant to say. You did promise that I would see her again. The magician answered him sharply, I promised only that you would see sign of unicorns, and so you have. Your realm is blessed beyond any lands deserving, because they have passed across it in freedom. As for you, and your heart, and the things you said and didn't say, she will remember them when all men are fairy tales and books written by rabbits. Think of that and be still. The king spoke no more after that, and Schmendrick repented of his words. She touched you twice, he said in a little while. The first touch was to bring you to life again, but the second was for you. Lear did not answer, and the magician never knew if he had heard him or not. Schmendrick dreamed that the unicorn came and stood by him at moonrise. The thin night wind lifted and spilled her mane, and the moon shone on the snowflake crafting of her small head. He knew it was a dream, but he was happy to see her. How beautiful you are, he said. I never really told you. He would have roused the others, but her eyes sang him a warning as clearly as two frightened birds, and he knew that if he moved to call Molly and Lear, he would wake himself and she would vanish. So he said only, They love you more, I think, though I do the best I can. That is why, she said and he could not tell what she was answering. He lay very still, hoping that he would remember the exact shape of her ears when he did wake in the morning. She said, You are a true and mortal wizard now, as you've always wished. Does it make you happy? Yes, he replied with a quiet laugh. I'm not poor haggard to lose my heart's desire in the having of it. But there are wizards and wizards. There is black magic and white magic, and the infinite shades of gray between. And I see now that it's all the same. Whether I decide to be what men would call a wise and good magician, aiding heroes, thwarting witches, wicked lords and unreasonable parents, making rain, curing wool sorters disease and the mad staggers, getting cats down from trees, or whether I choose the retorts full of elixirs and essences, the powders and herbs and banes, the padlock boots of Grimire bound in skins better left unnamed, the muddy mist darkening in the chamber and the sweet voice lisping therein. Why, life is short, and how many can I help or harm? I have my power at last, 
but the world is still too heavy for me to move, though my friend Lear might think otherwise. And he laughed again in his dream, a little sadly. The unicorn said, That is true. You are a man, and men can never do anything that makes any difference. But her voice was strangely slow and burdened. She asked, Which will you choose? The magician laughed for a third time. Oh, it will be the kind magic, undoubtedly, because you would like it more. I do not think that I will ever see you again, but I will try to do what would please you if you knew. And you, where will you be for the rest of my life? I thought you would have gone to home to your forest by now. She turned a little away from him, and the sudden starlight of her shoulders made all his talk of magic taste like sand in his throat. Moths and midges and other night insects too small to be anything in particular came and danced slowly around her bright horn, and this did not make her appear foolish, but them most wise and lovely as they celebrated her. Molly's cat rubbed in and out between her forefeet. The others are gone, she said. They are scattered to the woods they came from, no two together, and men will not catch sight of them much more easily than if they were still in the sea. I will go back to my forest, too, but I do not know if I will live contentedly there or anywhere. I have been mortal, and some part of me is mortal yet. I am full of tears and hunger and the fear of death, though I cannot weep and I want nothing and I cannot die. I am not like the others now, for no unicorn was ever born who could regret. But I do. I regret. Schmendrick hid his face like a child, though he was a great magician. I am sorry. I am so sorry, he mumbled into his wrist. I have done you evil, as Nikos did to the other unicorn, with the same good will, and I can no more undo it than he could. Mommy Fortuna and King Haggard and the Red Bull together were kinder to you than I. But she answered him gently, saying, My people are in the world again. No sorrow will live in me as long as that joy, save one. And I thank you for that, too. Farewell, good magician. I will try to go home. She made no sound when she left him. But he was awake, and the crook-eared cat was meowing lonesomely. Turning his head, he saw the moonlight trembling in the open eyes of King Lear and Molly Grew. The three of them lay awake till morning, and nobody said a word. At dawn, King Lear rose up and saddled his horse. Before he mounted, he said to Schmendrick and Molly, I would like it if you came to see me one day. They assured him that they would, but still he lingered with them, twisting the dangling reins about his fingers. I dreamed about her last night, he said. Molly cried, so did I, and Schmendrick opened his mouth and then closed it again. King Lear said hoarsely, by our friendship, I beg you, tell me what she said to you. His hands gripped one hand of each of theirs and his clutch was cold and painful. Schmendrick gave him a weak smile. My lord, I so rarely remember my dreams. It seems to me that we spoke solemnly of silly things, as one does. Grave nonsense, empty and evanescent. The king let go of his hand and turned his half-mad gaze on Molly Grew. I'll never tell, she said, a little frightened, but flushing oddly. I remember, but I'll never tell anyone. If I die for it, not even you, my lord. She was not looking at him as she spoke, but at Schmendrick. King Lear let her hand fall as well, and he swung himself up into the saddle so fiercely that his horse reared up across the sunrise, bugling like a stag. But Lear kept his seat and glared down at Molly and Schmendrick with a face so grim and scored and sunken that he might as well have been king as long as haggard before him. She said nothing to me, he whispered. Do 
do you understand? She said nothing to me, nothing at all. Then his face softened, and even King Haggard's face had gone a little gentle when he watched the unicorns in the sea. For that moment, he was again the young prince who would like to sit with Molly in the scullery. He said, She looked at me in my dream. She looked at me and never spoke. He rode away without goodbye, and they watched after him until the hills hid him, a straight, sad horseman going home to be king. Molly said at last, Oh, the poor man. Poor Lear. He has not fared so badly, the magician answered. Great heroes need great sorrows and burdens, or half their greatness goes unnoticed. It is all part of the fairy tale. But his voice was a little doubtful, and he laid his arm softly about Molly's shoulders. It cannot be an ill fortune to have loved a unicorn, he said. Surely it must be the dearest luck of all, though the hardest earned. By and by, he put her as far from him as his fingers' ends, and asked her, Now, will you tell me what it was she said to you? But Molly grew only laughed, and shook her head till her hair came down, and she was more beautiful than the Lady Amalthea. The magician said, Very well, then I will find the unicorn again, and perhaps she will tell me. And he turned calmly to whistle up their steeds. She said no word while he saddled his horse, but when he began to put her own, she put her hand on his arm. Do you think, do you truly hope that we may find her? There was something that I forgot to say. Schmendrick looked over at her, over his shoulder. The morning sunlight made his eyes seem as gay as grass, but now and then, when he stooped into the horse's shadow, there stirred a deeper greenness in his gaze, the green of pine needles that has a faint, cool bitterness about it. He said, I fear it, for her sake. It will mean that she too is a wanderer now, and that is a fate for human beings, not for unicorns. But I hope, of course I hope. Then he smiled at Molly and took her hand in his. Anyway, since you and I must choose one road to follow, out of the many that run to the same place in the end, it might as well be a road that a unicorn has taken. We may never see her, but we will always know where she has been. Come then, come with me. So they began their new journey, which took them in its time, in and out of the most of the folds of the sweet, wicked, wrinkled world and so at last to their own strange and wonderful destiny. But that was all later. And first, not ten minutes out of Lear's kingdom, they met a maiden who came hurrying towards them on foot. Her dress was torn and smirched, but the richness of its making was still plain to see, and though her hair was tumbled and brambled, her arms scratched and her fair face dirty, there was no mistaking her for anyone but a princess in woeful distress. Schmendrick lighted down to support her, and she clutched him with both hands as though he were a grapefruit hull. A rescue, she cried. A rescue, O oh, Sikor! And ye be a man of metal and sympathy. Aid me now. I am the princess Alison Jocelyn, daughter to good King Giles, and him foully murdered by his brother, the bloody Duke Wolf, who hath taken my three brothers, the princes Corin, Colin, and Calvin, and cast them into a fell prison as hostages, that I will wed his fat son, the Lord Dudley. But I bribed the sentinel, and sopped the dogs. But Schmendrick, the magician, raised his hand, and she fell silent staring up at him in wonder out of wild lilac eyes fair princess he said gravely to her the man you want just went that way and he pointed back towards the land that they so lately quitted take my horse and you will be up with him when your shadow is still behind you he cupped his hands for the princess alice and jocelyn and she climbed wearily and in some bewilderment to the saddle schmendrick turned the horse saying you will surely overtake him with ease, for he will be riding slowly. He is a good man, and a hero greater than any cause is worth. 
I send all my princesses to him. His name is Lear. Then he slapped the horse on the rump and sent it off on the way King Lear had gone. And then he laughed for so long that he was too weak to get up behind Molly and had to walk beside her horse for a while. When he caught his breath, he began to sing, and she joined with him. And this is what they sang as they went away together, out of this story and into another. I am no king, I am no lord, I am no soldier at arms, said he. I am none but a harper, and a very poor harper, that am come hither to wed with thee. If you were a lord, and you should be my lord, and the same if you were a thief, said she, and if you a harper, you shall be my harper, for it makes no matter to me, to me, for it makes no matter to me. But what if it prove that I am no harper, that I lied for your love most monstrously? Why then I'll teach you to play and sing, for I love, I dearly love a good harp, said she.